Now, depending on who you ask, epidemiology and pharmacoepidemiology can be considered to be only to do with observational or non-randomised studies. Now, personally, and at the School of Hygiene, we consider pharmacoepidemiology to involve both non-randomised and randomised studies. So that's just to make clear to you over the next couple of days. I'll talk to you about examples where it's both either randomised or non-randomised uh, studies. And I think we can potentially use both of these kinds of studies to try to investigate things like risk minimisation or to investigate safety signals further. So just to clarify, that's what I mean. I think that the two kinds of evidence that we get from both trials and non-randomised studies can be complementary. And I've got a couple of slides explaining why I think they're complementary and what the different strengths and weaknesses are. So, first of all, if we think about the number of patients included in a study, in our pre-marketing randomised trials, it's going to be low. Whereas, if we're going to do an observational study, especially if we're going to use electronic health records, then potentially we can include very large numbers of patients. For the duration of treatment or follow-up, again, in our pre-marketing trials, this is going to be fairly short. Whereas in our observational studies, we can look over potentially decades if we've got the information, which again, we will often have in electronic health records. We can look over very long periods to see what's happening. The cost of a pre-marketing randomised trial, as I'm sure you're all aware, is very expensive, whereas non-randomised studies tend to be much cheaper to do, particularly if we're relying on data that's already been recorded as part of an electronic health record. Even randomised trials of treatments where we're not going to expose people for very long, maybe they're only going to be exposed for six months or a year, they will still take a very long time to do for the drug company from starting the trial, enrolling the first patients, continuing to enrol which can take several years and then finalising the study can be a very long process. The non-randomised studies, particularly if we rely on data that's already been recorded in the past, will be much quicker to do, although you may be surprised, and Masao will maybe talk about this on Friday, the length of time to do an observational study is still probably longer than you may imagine, but still much quicker than a, a randomised trial. Um, the ethics of the studies are very different. So the, if the ethics of a randomised trial may mean that we can't do a study. So if there's already a clear known benefit of a treatment, we may not be able to randomise people to that treatment, whereas we can do an observational study where we simply look at what did people prescribe for their clinical reasons. The patients that we include in the study in a, a pre-marketing trial will tend not to represent the population that will be exposed, whereas if we're looking at observational data especially electronic health records, then it will be driven entirely by people from the general population. Okay, so from, from that slide you would think, I imagine that only non-randomised studies are very good. <coughs> it's not the case at all. Um, so, pre-marketing trials, patients will receive extremely good care. And it means that we have a really good chance of being able to see what is the true effect or the best effect of a treatment. In routine care or observational studies, patients don't receive the best clinical care, they just receive normal clinical care, which can mean that we don't see the same effects. <coughs> of course, the key advantage of the randomised trial is that treatment allocation is made at random, which means that when we come to make inference about causes and effects, 
we have the best chance possible in a randomized trial. Okay? In our observational studies, the treatment is decided by the, the healthcare professional and the patient, and of course is driven by clinical need, all sorts of considerations, and so it means that when we come to make inference about cause and effect, it's much more problematic. <clears throat> so our, our randomized trials are much less prone to bias compared with the observational studies. Who has come across the term hierarchy of evidence before? A few people. Now, if you Google hierarchy of evidence, you will find a million different diagrams that all look depressingly exactly like this. They're all the same. Now, and they all have meta-analysis and systematic review at the very pinnacle of this hierarchy. And then we go down to individual randomized trial, then cohort study, case control study, cross-sectional study, animal trials, case reports and opinion. And they all have this exact same structure and that we should only view evidence in this way. Now personally, I don't like these hierarchies because I think that they invite us as investigators to be quite lazy in the way that we think about what's the question that I'm asking? What's the research question? and what's the best evidence for that research question. And I'm going to demonstrate to you why I think this. But before I do, I want to make really clear that I'm not in any way saying anything bad about randomised trials. I think randomised trials are one of the best ways we have to assess the effect of a treatment on an outcome. So I would say to you, that if we've got a situation where we've got one single research question, okay, does this treatment cause this adverse effect? And we've got a, a given population, the population of Japan, let's say, and we have two options. We can either randomize within the population in Japan who could receive that treatment, or we can do an observational study where we simply look at what happened in routine clinical care. But remember, so this randomised population is going to be drawn at random from the whole population. So we're not excluding pregnant women, we're not excluding children, it's a genuine population sample. If we're in that situation, I'm always going to trust the results of the randomised trial more than I'll trust the results of the observational study. There's no doubt about that in my mind. But I think that this situation is very rare. I don't often find myself faced with a research question where I've got either of both of these options available to me. But just to be clear, if I do, I'm always going to trust the randomised trial. Okay, so I want to get that out of the way before I then go on to say what I'm going to say. So. I want to show you a different example now, and it's the example of COX-2 inhibitors. So these are the most recent class of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. I'm sure you'll be familiar with them. And the trials, the pre-marketing trials, showed that they had improved safety compared with the older non-steroidals specifically in terms of their gastrointestinal bleeding risk. And it was the reason that they were developed with because the mechanism meant it was much less likely you would have a GI bleed with them compared with the older versions. The trouble is, when people did observational studies, this benefit didn't seem to be there. Now, has anybody got any ideas why this might have been the case. Why would the trials show a gastrointestinal benefit, but the observational studies in real world usage showed very little or no benefit? Why might that be the case? Any thoughts? Sorry, would you repeat again? 
Yeah, so the, the randomized trials before marketing showed that the new COX-2 inhibitors had less gastrointestinal bleeding associated with them than the older non-steroidals like ibuprofen, naproxen. They had more GI bleed, the COX-2 inhibitors less GI bleed. That's the trials, so we, we believe that that was a causal difference. But when people did observational studies using electronic health records, they couldn't find a difference in the GI bleeding between the two. And I'm asking, can anybody think of any reasons why that might be the case? Adherence. Adherence. Adherence could be one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it could be that adherence was very different. It, yeah, it would mean that we were studying people not really taking much of anything, which could be true, yeah. Ah, say more. So what might they be using? Maybe they use for hypertension or other disease, they use different medicine and these effects. Yeah, it could have been due to taking other medicine. It could specifically, in this instance, have been due to taking gastroprotective treatments. That could have been happening differently. So that's one, one possibility as well. Any others? Yes, the series of diseases, yes, they maybe suffer from different diseases, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so you've got some great reasons though. So that final one was to do with confounding, where you maybe were treating quite different types of people with the COX-2 inhibitors and the NSAIDs and another one. Ah, okay, this is another really good point. So if we were starting our observational studies amongst people who've already taken the treatment for some time, then we may come to a false conclusion. So it's great, you've picked some reasons that may be to do with the observational study not being very well done. So for example, taking prevalent users would be a problem. If we couldn't adjust for the baseline differences between our populations, that would also be a big problem. Uh, we also have the suggestion that maybe the people in the trials are quite different from the people in routine care, or maybe they're taking different treatments, or maybe they're adherence. And these are all great problems that we have to think about when we're doing non-randomized studies. Now, in fact, what happened was, and there's a great paper here by uh, an investigator called Thierd van Star, and he found that on average, in the trials, people were exposed to the COX-2 inhibitors for between six and nine months. So fairly long, longish term treatment, and they mostly had rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, that was the population studied in the trials. Now these new COX-2 inhibitors were much more expensive than the older non-steroidals, which were very cheap. But they said, the company said, it's fine because we have this big, big benefit. 
people on these new treatments will not get GI bleeds. So although the cost of the treatment is more, the overall cost of treatment for patients will be probably lower or similar because they won't be having these GI bleeds, they won't go to hospital, so things will be better. Now in fact, what they found was that the average length of exposure in routine clinical care once the treatments had been launched was one or two months. So people were maybe only being given one prescription and then that would then lead to the most they could take it for in the UK would be one month. But it's possible to come back to your point about adherence. Maybe they took the treatment for a week and then they didn't need it anymore. So they, they didn't take very much of it. The thing is, in these short exposure periods, people would then not have such a high risk of a GI bleed that would take some time to develop. So, in fact, it was all to do with the treatment populations being quite different. The indication that people were given the treatment for in routine care was often things like a, maybe some kind of sports injury. So not rheumatoid arthritis and not requiring long-term treatment. So the claimed benefit in the trials just wasn't translated to routine care. And we could never have known that by doing a randomised trial. We could only know by actually looking what's happening in routine care. And is this benefit real? Or in fact, is it pointless to pay so much more money for the new treatment when in fact the benefit that you claim won't apply to this population? So I give that as an example where I think the hierarchy of evidence would not be very helpful because you need to think about what's the research question I'm trying to ask and what's the best evidence for that research question, okay? But I do want people to stay wary of the results of observational studies too. So another example I have is of hormone replacement therapy, which we give a symptomatic relief from menopausal symptoms. But for a long time, there was a perceived idea that HRT would also reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and of Alzheimer's. This was partly circumstantial evidence that people looked at women pre- and post-menopause and found that post-menopause, the risk of heart disease and Alzheimer's was higher. There were marker studies looking at um, blood markers of disease that again showed that post-menopause it may be, or people on HRT, maybe had a lower risk of these diseases. And there were some specific observational pharmacoepi studies that showed it to be an advantage. Now then in 2002, there was a large randomised trial called the Women's Health Initiative, which reported an increased risk of cardiovascular disease amongst women taking HRT. So this was the opposite of what we expected. They also had an increased risk of breast cancer, but a reduced risk of fractures. So this was all not what we expected based on the observational results. So what went wrong? Well, there's a great commentary here, written at the time by Debbie Lawler, and if you're interested, I, I suggest you go and find this. It's a great, great paper to read, not just about HRT, but about what can go wrong with observational studies of drug effects in general. What happened was the, the people who were exposed and unexposed to HRT were fundamentally different. Healthy women tended to take HRT. Now, healthy women would tend to have less heart disease. So there's one problem. Some of the studies used prevalent users. So they didn't start at the point in time where women started their treatment with HRT. In fact, if you're going to have a heart problem with HRT, it will happen close to the start of treatment. So if we kill all of those women with HRT and then start to study the women that can continue taking it longer term, they're going to look much healthier. So it's a problem. This is a major issue in pharmacoepidemiology. And in this instance, randomized evidence was the key. So I hope you take away from this that I believe that randomized and non-randomized studies are complementary 
and that it depends very much what's the question that we're trying to answer. Sometimes one will be better than the other.